Thank you, Joan, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, again, I'll be brief, uh, and I'll focus on two concepts that re relate to the Greek Revolution and War of Independence. One of them is the idea of the nation and how it's evolved into the present, and the other one is the idea of independence and how that's evolved in its tortured way into the present. And in terms of the nation, and because after all, the Greek Revolution produced uh, the Greek nation state, and it was the first of Europe. Uh, meaning a state which is identified with its own people. And it was kind of a surprise at the time, and we should understand that it came a very violent process uh, by which a territory which was Ottoman and multi-confessional, full of different religions, was reduced to only one religion. And that religion would be Orthodox Christianity with some allowances for Catholics. Um, this is an extremely violent process. Uh, it came about partly under the influence of Europeans who thought that Greece and Europe had to be Christian. Um, and what we see of the is in the revolution is the um, uh, an overhaul of the nature of local demographics so that we're left with only one population as understood by the revolutionaries and understood by the European powers. Uh, we see the disappearance of Islam completely. And it's part of this narrative of the nation, which still exists today in, in certain narratives, uh, which is the nation is inherently violent. And of course it is. Any revolution will be violent. Um, and this one was particularly left behind in devastation. Um, we still speak about the nation and its dangers, uh, that it's total, that it's complete, uh, that it doesn't allow for outsiders in some cases, and this is true and it's a conversation we still have. Um, but there's another part of the debate which we've been having, hearing less of, which is the um, visit that the nation helped people in the past 200 years. Um, and the nation in something different beginning with the Greek nation and continuing all across the Balkans and ultimately globally, it contributed a sense that, uh, um, that people are no longer just subjects and inhabitants citizens, right? At the very least, they have entitlements and they can make demands. Um, the Greek revolution endowed the local population, those who survive, that is, with a sense that they too can, they too can demand a better life. And the improvement, which is remarkable over the past 200 years, which we see in this region and in Greece, uh, owes largely to this concept of citizenship, of the individual being protected uh, individually and as property, um, and uh, being able to invest it and to operate freely within certain shared norms. Uh, so these are the two sides of the idea of the nation, uh, both of which I think are true. Um, but the other one is independence. Uh, independence is also a mixed bag. Uh, so the Greek War of Independence resulted in the creation of the Greek state, more or less by 1830. Um, and this state was uh, said to be sovereign and independent. Now, sovereignty also meant that you take on sovereign debt. And so part of the history of the past 200 years has been the fight for independence, um, uh, but the acquisition of sovereign debt, which has burdened the country for the past 200 years. Um, uh, we know that even in the course of the revolution, the first loans came about, uh, came, coming from Britain. Those uh, Greece became responsible for in the succeeding decades. The new state was given uh, very large loans by the three protecting powers. Um, this was a burden on the country. It involved um, uh, the occupation of certain ports in order to seize revenues. Uh, this was in the 1850s and in the 1890s. And of course, if you want the ob obvious example, it would be uh, 2010, 2012, up until the present day, and the, um, uh, the sort of, you know, the, um, uh, the burden that presented and the tra transformations that have been imposed on the country. So if you look at it this way, independence means there's an independent country being smacked around and pressured by outside powers. And, and of course, this is true. It is, that is the case to some extent. Uh, but we often neglect to recognize that outside powers become factors in domestic politics. Even the most uh, severe um, uh, austerity measures when they're imposed often have local supporters as well who see it as an opportunity to introduce one or another reform, for better or for worse. Uh, which is to say, um, the lenders of the 1830s and 1840s were each intervening with their own parties in Greek politics. Um, Fast forward to the present and the, uh, the Troika and the imposition of austerity measures on the country. There were a lot of people at the time, which we didn't hear about, but they're, they're, they're legion, who believed that things had gone too far with conspicuous consumption and, and personal debt and also national debt. And this was a time to be able to introduce what they considered to be more rational, and which was to say about balanced budget and with it cutbacks, um, cutbacks which would fall in one or another place according to one's politics. So it's not entirely, and it has never been entirely a matter of an outside country or a group of countries imposing their will on this country. It's also how those countries become part of domestic politics and allow 
players domestically um, to practice their politics to pursue their goals. Um, and as we saw for the previous speaker, a very good representation of, of that point of view, um, which is that the idea of discipline and balanced budgets ultimately is a good thing for the country, uh, as opposed to others who believe that this is basically a form of national torture. Um, uh, this is also the legacy of the past 200 years. And uh, uh, Joan, I'm going to leave it at that. 